I, I first saw a clip of you online talking over 10 years ago. And the clip in question is called Sugar, the Bitter Truth. And it's been seen online millions of times since then. 24 spoke, million. 24 million. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, in that video, you spoke at length about sugar over that 90 minutes. You spoke with passion about sugar. I was engrossed. And ever since that day, I have to be honest, my view of sugar which was already tainted prior to that video. Well, it was completely transformed afterwards. And you said at one point that sugar was deemed by society at large to be celebratory, but now it has become part of a staple of our diet and that it is killing us. Can you spell out how sugar is so lethal and what we've continued to learn about sugar's lethality since that video of yours was published over 10 years ago? Well, first of all, thank you, Matthew. Um, the the most important thing for your audience to know is that that video is now 14 years old and everything in it is still true. And we actually now have way more data and I'm not the only one saying it anymore. So there really has been a groundswell. And the reason is because the data are there. I mean, it's very clear what's going on now. People think that sugar is just empty calories, okay? They don't do anything else other than provide energy. Well, turns out that's not exactly so. It is energy, and I'm not arguing that, but can you name another energy source that is not food, that there's no biochemical reaction in the body that requires it. That there's no dietitian on the planet who would consider it nutrition. That when consumed in excess, it kills your cells, your body, and ultimately your brain, and finally you. And we love it, and it's addictive. Now, there's nothing else that springs to mind, certainly for me. Alcohol. Okay. Alcohol are calories. Alcohol is seven calories per gram. All right. But there's nobody on the planet who would say that alcohol was nutrition, that alcohol was food, that alcohol was valuable other than celebratory. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that sugar and alcohol are metabolized virtually identically. And that's the problem. Now, it is true that 10% of alcohol will go to the brain and cause cerebral depression. And that's, of course, why we keep it out of the hands of children. But we now know that there are certain parts, not the entire brain, but certain parts of the brain that do metabolize the molecule fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, and cause significant damage there as well. Just not the kind of you know brain fog that alcohol causes. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we're killing our brains with sugar. My colleague, Dr. Rick Johnson and Dr. Dale Bredesen, another colleague, um, uh, just wrote a paper basically fingering fructose as perhaps not the driver, but a driver of Alzheimer's disease. Bottom line, fructose does three things that other foodstuffs don't. Number one, it inhibits mitochondrial function. It's supposed to stimulate it, it inhibits it. Number two, it causes the Maillard or the browning or the aging reaction, the same reaction that occurs when we paint our ribs with barbecue sauce and put them on the grill, that browning, okay? Well, that is what happens inside your eye when you get cataracts. That's what wrinkles are. That is the aging reaction, and that is happening all over your body. And fructose drives that seven times faster than any other foodstuff. And finally, fructose, for lack of a better word, is addictive. Okay, it stimulates the reward center and says, This feels good. I want more. And anything that stimulates the reward center in the extreme is addictive. So, we have chemical addictions like cocaine, nicotine, you know, heroin, uh, alcohol, sugar. We have behavioral addictions like shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social media, pornography. Okay, in the extreme, all of those are addictive. 
Well, sugar is no different. So what we have is a vicious cycle of consumption and disease and it's consumption of metabolic health diseases like type two diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, et cetera. And it's also mental health diseases, including addiction, depression, problems with cognition, uh, dementia, as I mentioned, Alzheimer's. Um, uh, so, you know, it is at the seat of our metabolic and mental health debacle. And so it is unique in that respect. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to point out how important this is and how we need to get a hold of it. And we haven't thus far. Are any forms or sources of sugar acceptable? I'm talking about natural sugars uh, in things like honey or in fruit, for example. Fruit. So f fruit, the, the question, so f first of all, <clears throat> fruit has fructose. It's true. And it's the same exact molecule as, you know, Kool-Aid has fructose. All right. There's no difference in the molecule. But what is the difference? What's the difference between Kool-Aid and whole fruit? And the answer is the fiber. Now, the fiber in the whole fruit actually acts as a barrier to intestinal absorption. So when you consume the whole fruit, the soluble and insoluble fiber will work together to form an, in, a, a gel, an impenetrable barrier. Think of it like the insoluble fiber, like the cellulose, the stringy stuff in celery, acts like the fishnet. And then the soluble fiber, which are globular, plug the holes in the fishnet like the kelp. And together, the fishnet and the kelp, you now have a barrier. You can't even catch the fish until you've cleaned the fishnet, right? Well, every time you swallow a piece of whole fruit, that fishnet and um, uh, plugging of the holes occurs inside your duodenum. And that reduces the rate of absorption of glucose, fructose, sucrose, simple starches, and renders them unavailable for early absorption. So even though you consumed it, you didn't absorb it. So it passed your lips, but it didn't pass your intestine. So if it didn't get absorbed early, it moves further down the intestine. And what happens to it there? It gets to the jejunum, the second part of the intestine, where the microbiome, the bacteria that live in your intestine, eat it for their purposes instead. So even though you ate it, you didn't get it. You didn't feed yourself. You fed your bacteria. And that's a good thing to do. And that's why whole fruit works. And whole fruit has been shown to actually be protective against diabetes and heart disease. Whereas fruit juice, where the fiber has been removed, has been shown to be stimulatory to diabetes and heart disease. So because whole fruit and fruit juice are not the same. If somebody listening to this podcast episode, if they give up sugar on day one of the month, what will be the state of their physiology at the the 30th day of the month, the final day of the month? What what mm -hmm. changes will they see in the, in the course of four weeks? You mean if they consumed, consumed it every single day? No, no. If, if they had it's been consuming months? sugar up to up to that month and they decided to go cold turkey on sugar, oh, how, oh, how okay. quickly will they see an improvement in their physiology? I see. Okay. In other words, if they discontinue, if they yes. um, they abstain from yes. sugar, how quickly that will they see? We know from the studies that we've done here at UCSF in San Francisco that children who, where we took the sugar out of their diet and put extra starch in, so that calories were the same, so that they didn't lose weight, we saw improvements in blood pressure, in heart rate, in glucose area under the curve on a glucose tolerance test, insulin area under the curve on a glucose tolerance test, liver fat, um, and pancreatic insulin secretion in as little as 10 days, 10 days. And my colleagues in adult medicine did the same thing in adults and saw the effect on liver fat within two weeks. So it doesn't take long. It will occur relatively quickly. 
if we can talk about the statement from the WHO, they recently uh, made a statement in relation to the mad made uh, sweetener aspartame uh, that yeah. has been categorized now as a carcinogen. Can you talk yeah. to us about sugar substitutes in general and the health implications of their consumption as you see it? Sure. So everybody wants diet sweeteners to be the answer. Uh, unfortunately, they're not. So it is true that diet sweeteners don't have calories. And if calories were the reason for cutting back on sugar, then diet sweeteners might make sense. But it's not about calories. I've just told you it's not about calories. It's about the molecule itself. When you say, but, but there's no fructose in those diet sweeteners. They should be fine. Well, they have their own problems. So the uh, epidemiological studies show that the toxicity of one Coca-Cola equals the toxicity of two diet Coca-Colas. So half as bad, but half as bad does not mean good, all right? All right, so it would be better if you did nothing, neither of those, but the fact is um, they're half as bad. Now, why are they half as bad if they don't have any calories? Again, it has nothing to do with calories. Um, number one, you put something sweet on the tongue, Message goes, tongue to brain, sugar's coming, brain goes, uh, sugar's coming, sends a message via the pancreas to release insulin, even though it's not sugar. So you get the insulin response anyway, and it turns out that insulin response is the thing that drives the chronic metabolic disease. Not the glucose, but the insulin. And so even though you get it, it because you get an insulin response, it's still a problem. In addition, okay, those various uh, um, diet sweeteners have other effects on the intestine. Um, the group from uh, Weizmann Institute, Elenov's group, Aaron Siegel and Elenov, uh, have shown that it causes leaky gut and glucose intolerance anyway. And now we have lots of data that show that, for instance, erythritol has been associated with cardiovascular disease and um, uh, aspartame, as you said, you know, has been shown to be probably carcinogenic by the WHO. So it's not a good uh, second uh, answer. Uh, you know, we ultimately do need a good second answer. And people are working on that. But um, diet sweeteners turn out to not be the panacea that we thought they were. Now, you're probably one of the greatest proponents of eating real food as opposed to man-made food that there that is out there. Why do you think the message about ultra processed foods and in relation to sugar still isn't being put into action? Because the information is out there, it's widely available, and it has been thanks to people like yourself. Well, I, I would say that there are two main reasons. One, the food industry, this is their juggernaut and they're not giving it up easy. Okay. And so they're plowing millions and millions and billions of dollars into marketing to basically make people think that their food is fine. And the other is denial. You know, people don't want this to be true. I understand it's an inconvenient truth. You know, they didn't want climate change to be true either. And look what happened. The fact of the matter is, this is a public health crisis and we have to treat it as such. You know, people think, oh, I can de determine on my own what it is that I put in my mouth, you know, individual, uh, you know, personal responsibility. Okay, That doesn't work for a public health crisis. You know, there are a lot of things that we said were personal responsibility issues, you know, like tuberculosis, like um, uh, COVID, like, um, uh, you know, teen pregnancy, like HIV which turned out to be public health crises. Every personal responsibility issue is really a public health crisis. And you have to treat it as such. You can't just leave it to you know, the, the masses to make their own decisions because when you do, things blow up out of control. You ultimately need individual intervention, which you know, in the case of sugar would be called rehab. And you also need societal intervention you know, which for lack of a better word, we can call laws, you know, for every other toxic and addictive substance, we've had rehab and laws for nicotine, for, to, you know, to, uh, for uh, alcohol, you know, we've had rehab and laws, you know, unfortunately, we're going to end up having to need, need the same thing for sure.
Well, I, I know you explore the whole impact, the negative influence that uh, corporate America has on uh, the uh, has on people's minds in your book, The Hacking of the American Mind. And uh, it, it was interesting. I was watching the Women's uh, Soccer World Cup uh, before uh, I engaged with you in this interview. And I noticed one of the sponsors was Coca-Cola. Uh, Always. So- their, their, their effects it seem to be, well, not insidious, because insidious would suggest that it's happening very subtly. They're very open. They're very vocal about their sponsoring all of the seemingly sporting events. Uh, but it, um, it, it really brings home just how of a vocal, how obvious they are and how widely accepted these huge conglomerates are across the world, despite the negative effects that their products have. Well, you know, not everybody believes that uh, sugar is bad for you yet. You know, we're working on it. I I will say that the tide is turning. We actually have data that says that people are starting to get the message. Um, For instance, uh, there is a public relations arm of the food industry called IFIC, the International Food Information Council. And in 2011, every year they do a you know yearly report, and every year they ask the public a question. And in 2011. They asked the public, what is the food stuff that causes the most weight gain, causes obesity? And at that time, only 11% of the population said refined carbohydrate and sugar. Okay, 42% said a calorie is a calorie or I don't know. In 2018, they asked that exact same question the exact same way. And now it was exactly reversed. And now... 42% said refined carbohydrate and sugar, and only 11% said um, uh, a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. So we are teaching the public. There's no question the public's being educated. But as you can imagine, you know, this is an aircraft carrier, and it takes a long time to turn it around. You've spoken before about the benefits of a plant-based diet. There is still much resistance out there to uh, the benefits of of a plant-based diet. Can you talk to us about your thoughts on this? So I am not a plant-based diet guy. I am not against veganism. I'm not for it. Okay. What I'm for is real food. And veganism can be real food, but can also be Coke, Doritos, and Oreos. You know, it depends on how you do it, like everything. Same thing with keto, you know, I'm not for it. I'm not against it. You know, the fact of the matter is when you do it right, keto is excellent. The problem is most people are doing it wrong. And, you know, clinical studies have shown that when left to their own devices, after two months, you have regressed to the mean. You think you're on keto, you're not because you don't have any ketones in your breath. (laughs) And, And if you think you're on keto and you're not, you're probably actually on a high fat, medium carbohydrate diet, which is actually the worst diet you can be on. So in both cases, you know, it requires fastidiousness to be able to stay on a plant-based diet that is healthy or on a ketogenic diet that is healthy. And I think that if you ate real food, you wouldn't have to worry about any of this. And so is that your advice? Is that the takeaway then when it comes to, because obviously people listening to this are thinking there's so much information out there. There's so much knowledge and yeah. it's coming at them from every different angle. And, what, and in, most of it's wrong. So in, in your mind then, if, if we can set the record straight, then when you say real food, what what should people take from that as far as what they believe should be the, the major component of their diet? It's very simple. Matthew, if it has a label, it's a warning label. Okay, real food doesn't have a label. If a, if a food has a label, it's been processed in some fashion. Now, there are different levels of processing. That's true. My colleague, Dr. Carlos Montero at the University of Sao Paulo and his colleagues developed this thing called the NOVA system for classification of food processing. So all foods are Nova class one through Nova class four. So uh, let's give you an example. Let's take an apple. So Nova class one would be an apple picked off the tree. Nova class two would be apple slices, de-stemmed, de-seeded, possibly de-skinned. Nova class three would be apple sauce, macerated, possibly with sugar added. Nova class four would be a McDonald's apple pie. 
Now it's been shown that only that Nova class four designation is associated with chronic metabolic disease. So Nova classes one through three are actually probably okay, no problem. It's only that Nova class four, but it just so happens that 73% of the food consumed in America and the UK is in that Nova class four. And that's what's killing you. So how do you stay away from that? Well, a good way to do it is stay away from anything with a label. And another a simple rule of thumb that I read that you had uh, you had espoused before was that if you're in your local store, local supermarket, and you look at the ingredients of uh, an item or a product that you you want to purchase, if sugar appears in the first three ingredients, you have said. Well, basically, that product is a dessert. That's correct. So, you know, I mean, people need to understand, you know, that Chinese chicken salad is dessert. <laughs> and, you know, they don't think of it that way, but that's the way they need to think about it. And the food, the, the sugar has been added to virtually everything because it increases palatability, of course, which translates to increasing sales. So the food industry adds the sugar for their purposes, not for yours. In addition, people say, oh yeah, but sugar can't be addictive. Oh yes, it can, and I can prove it. There's an economic arbiter of addiction. It's called price elasticity. Now, have you ever heard of price elasticity, Matthew? I, I studied okay. economics a few years ago, yes. Very good, so the, the uh, for your audience. So price elasticity is how how, how will consumption change when the price of any given item goes up 1%. Okay. So if a food item is price elastic, when the price uh, goes up 1%, then the consumption will go down close to 1%. So the most price elastic item in our uh, supermarket is eggs. Okay. They have a price elasticity uh, index of 0.32 which means that if the price of eggs go up 1%, consumption of eggs go down 0.68%. Okay, so that's how it works. Price inelastic foods mean that when the price goes up, consumption doesn't change. It stays high. So what are the most price inelastic foods? Fast food, soda, juice. So when the price of those go up, you keep buying them. And the reason is because you need your fix. Extraordinary. It's 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 funny that you mention uh, soda drinks there. I, I have to say that here in Ireland, in the last couple of years, we have actually imposed a sugar tax on soda drinks and fizzy drinks. Now, it is the tip of the iceberg, but it does begin to broach the subject that I know you've spoken before in the past. If I can actually quote one of your own quotes back to you. Uh, you pose this question about sugar. Why wouldn't you tax something that has no redeeming value whatsoever and is so dangerous? And I suppose it makes sense because it's very similar to taxing tobacco. Well, so the public health community has agreed on four criteria that are necessary for regulation of any given item, foodstuff or otherwise. And here are the four. Ubiquity, you can't get away from it. Toxicity has to be bad for you. Abuse, that is, people basically inappropriately consume it and use it. And lastly, externalities, which means how does my consumption affect you? Okay, that it bothered, you know, it hurts somebody else, not just the person who's using. All right. So those four have to be met. So tobacco, alcohol, clearly meet all four, ubiquity, toxicity, abuse, and externalities. Does sugar meet those four? And the answer is absolutely it does. Ubiquity, it's in 73% of the food. That's pretty ubiquitous. Toxicity, I just told you how it affects mitochondria, how it affects the aging reaction. Abuse, I just told you how it's addictive. And finally, externalities. What are the externalities of your sugar consumption? How does your sugar consumption affect me? Well, how about the NHS having no money? How about not being able to get in to see a doctor? 
How about when you get to the emergency room, okay, there are all these people on gurneys getting their TPA for their heart attacks, and you can't even get in to see a physician. How about the fact that healthcare is going to hell in a handbasket all over the world? Oh, and how about climate change? Because we have strafed the Amazon to make room for sugarcane fields. Okay, bottom line. You know, th this is a public health, global, environmental debacle. And we need to wake up, smell the coffee, not the sugared coffee, not the frappuccino, but the coffee. <laughs> okay, and we need to do something about it. And, you know, at the moment, we're still in education mode. You can't, you can't implement something until you've educated the public. And we're still in that process. You know, unfortunately, we only have so much time. Economist Jeffrey Sachs said a couple of years ago at the UN Food System Summit that we have a system of food delivery, but we need a different system. And I'm presuming you'd very much uh, agree with this sentiment. Dr. Sachs gave me the quote for my uh, on my book, Metabolical. Uh, yes. I mean, he basically said, you know, the, the, the food industry is failing in its core task. That is correct. And so if we can go back to responsibility, then you mentioned earlier that ultimately every situation of personal responsibility is actually uh, is a is a factor for public health. So. How can we get people who are the decision makers, the people who have the power, who have the authority, who have the influence to start making those decisions? We know we need the public to be more, um, to be better educated, as you just alluded to. But how can we get the people who need to take the lead to take that lead before it's too late? Uh, what a question, Matthew. You know, if I knew that, I'd probably be um, uh, running for president. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, politicians lead from behind and you know because they're afraid of getting voted out you know there's no courage in politics anymore and um, you've seen that in your own country look what happened to you and of course we've seen it here um this continues to be uh you know i think the single most important issue that we are facing today and it manifests itself in so many different ways how do you do that well I'll be honest with you, the public has to, you know, think that this is a priority, okay? When there are more votes than dollars, that's when politicians will start putting pressure on the food industry. And we're starting to see that. We are starting to see that, that the public is demanding better food. And, you know, it's, uh, and some companies are coming around, not nearly enough. And, you know, there are so you know, I mean, thousands of companies. And you know, so this is, uh, you know, something where it's going to take a very long time to blanket the entire world, you know, fixing this. But in fact, we have some examples. I'll give you an, an example I've worked with. Uh, there is a company in the Middle East. It's kind of the Nestle of the Middle East. It's called Kuwaiti Danish Dairy Company or KDD. You may have heard of it. Okay? And they used to make the worst food on the planet. They used to make frozen yogurts and ice cream and flavored milks and confectionery and biscuits and, you know, tomato sauce and, you know, basically all bad stuff. And the fact is <clears throat> they decided in 2020 that they were, they were part of the problem and they wanted to be part of the solution. And so they came to me and said, can you help us reorient our company so that we can be a metabolically healthy company. And so I put together a group of scientific advisors, uh, five of us in total, and we spent the next two years, two hours a uh, uh, at a time, two days a week, going through their entire portfolio of every single ingredient they purchase, that they make, that they put into their food, all the processing uh, 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 capabilities. And what we, uh, we developed a tiers system of determining which foods needed to go, which ones could stay, how to reorient the entire company. And at this juncture, three years later, ten, they have uh, turned over 10% of their entire portfolio 
to be metabolically healthy. And guess what? They haven't lost money. So this is a roadmap. And we've published this. This is in Frontiers in Nutrition at March of this year. And it's called The Metabolic Matrix. How to re-engineer ultra-processed food to be metabolically healthy by following three principles. Protect the liver, feed the gut, support the brain. Any food that does those three is, is healthy. Any food that does none of those three is poison. Any food that does one or two, but not all three, is somewhere in between. KDD will now have processed food that protects the liver, feeds the gut, and supports the brain. It will be healthy. Now, can other companies do that? Absolutely. They have to want to. Well, that certainly gives me hope and uh, it allows us to end this discussion, this fascinating discussion on an optimistic note. Can I thank you, Professor Robert Lustig, for your time and for your leadership on this, uh, this really very important subject. And uh, thank you for your contribution uh, to this podcast episode today. I really value uh, your contribution. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure, Matthew. And thank you for being such a good study and you know, uh, being so prepared for this uh, uh, discussion.